Well, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning to those who are um, tuning in uh, around the world. I'm Dr. Georges Benjamin. I'm the executive director here at the American Public Health Association in Washington, DC. And I wanna welcome you to the 21st webinar in the COVID-19 conversation series. This one is entitled The Fourth Wave, Vaccines, Variants, and the Future. It's brought to you by the American Public Health Association and the National Academy of Medicine. Now today's webinar has been approved for one and a half continuing education credits for CHESS, CME, CNE, and CPH. Now please note the speakers have, the dis um, have disclosed conflicts of interest. As you can see, there are none. And if you want continuing education credit, you need to have registered with your first and last name individually. And everyone who wants credit must, of course, have their own registration and watch today's event in its entirety. All of the participants today will receive an email within a few days from cpd at confex.com, that's cpd at confex.com, with information on how to claim these credits. And all online evaluations must be submitted by October the 4th to receive continued education credits. And again, that's submitting them the evaluations by October the 4th. The COVID-19 conversation series um, has been going on, you know, really for quite a while. We are gonna take a break for the foreseeable future, however. Um, and APHA and NAM have annual meetings in October, but we are planning at least one more webinar um, in November. I would like to obviously thank my co-hosts throughout this series, my good friend, Dr. Victor Zhao, and our co-chairs, Dr. Nicole Laurie and Dr. Carlos Del Rio for their active engagement and leadership. I'd like to thank our advisory committee, and let me just thank the, our, our staff who have worked tirelessly to put these series of webinars on. Um, if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to address today or on future webinars, please enter them in the Q&A box or email us at APHA at APHA.org. Now, if you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please enter your questions in the Q&A box and please pay attention to the chat for announcements on how to troubleshoot. Now, this webinar is being recorded and the recording and the transcript will be available on COVID19conversations.org, which is our website. That's COVID19conversations.org for the recording of the transcript. Now, more information on the series and recordings of past webinars are also available on that link. I'd now like to take the opportunity to introduce our moderator for today's conversation, Ms. Esther Krofal. Uh, Esther is the Executive Director of Fast Cures and the Center of Public Health at the Millican Institute. She has an amazing and deep experience in government, nonprofit, and the private sector, for which she has led uh, efforts to bring together diverse stakeholders um, to solve critical issues and achieve shared goals that improve the life of patients. Most recently, she was a Director of Public Policy leading GlaxoSmithKline's engagement with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and irrelevant executive branch agencies on broad healthcare policy issues. Over to you, Ms. Kofa. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin. And what a delight to be with all of you today that are participating in this webinar. I think it's safe to say as we sit here today that COVID-19 is testing all of us in the public, public health and research community in ways we couldn't have imagined a year ago. I certainly don't need to remind this audience of the devastating toll the pandemic has taken on lives and livelihoods here in the US and certainly around the world over the last 18 months. And sadly, those challenges continue. And of course, there have been major advances seeing highly effective vaccines safely over the finish line. But unfortunately, we're now in the middle of what has been described as the pandemic's fourth wave largely for the unvaccinated population. And the enthusiasm that we all had for a summer and perhaps a fall of unmasked get-togethers, parties, and 
quote unquote normal activities with friends and families. It's been replaced with a stark realization that the fall and the winter may look a lot like what we all experienced a year ago. Of course, all of this is happening as our children are returning to school. As you know, the virus has changed. We are seeing the spread of the Delta variant create the pandemic of the unvaccinated, which now also includes children much more frequently. We're also seeing breakthrough cases, international borders closing again, and heated debates about masks, mandates, and boosters. And so today we will address many of these challenges with a distinguished panel of public health experts and highlight the path forward. I'm sure there will be many questions for our speakers. So I'd like to remind all of you to use the Q&A feature to ask your questions as they arise throughout the presentations. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. If you can go ahead and turn your cameras on. First, Dr. George Rutherford is Professor of Epidemiology, Preventive Medicine, Pediatrics and History, and Head of the Division of, of Infectious Disease and Global Epidemiology in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of California, San Diego. His expertise is in the epidemiology and control of communicable diseases of public health significance with a particular focus on low and middle income countries. He will speak about the facts of the Delta variant and what comes next. Pleased to welcome Dr. Charlene Wong, who is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Public Policy at Duke University. She is a primary care pediatrician specializing in adolescent and young adult medicine. And among other distinguished positions, she serves as a Chief Health Policy Officer for COVID-19 at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Wong will address the impact of the pandemic on youth. Next, Dr. Peter Hotas, we've of course seen him um, in many settings, is the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and Professor of Pediatrics and Molecular Virology and Microbiology at Baylor College of Medicine, where he's also the co-director of the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development and Texas Children's Hospital Endowed Chair for Tropical Pediatrics, a member of the National Academy of Medicine and served in many different capacities in past administrations. He will talk about the impact of COVID on people 18 and older. And finally, we have Dr. Mitchell Katz, who serves as the President and Chief Executive Officer of the New York, Health, New York City Health and Hospitals, the largest municipal health system in the United States with 11 acute care hospitals, five skilled nursing facilities, array of community health centers and medical service serving inmates at Rikers Island Correctional Facility. He is a deputy editor of JAMA Internal Medicine and elected as a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a practicing primary care doctor. He will talk to us about what it will take to end this pandemic. So again, as I mentioned, we are delighted to have such expertise to talk about really critical, important topics we're all facing in this fourth wave. With that introduction, I will turn it over to Dr. Rutherford, who will talk about the vaccine variants and the state of the pandemic. Dr. Rutherford. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to, to be here. I'm actually at UC San Francisco. I, I would add a note in the chat about San Diego, which is I it led to that little, that small issue, but uh, so what happens when sand's in front of everything in the, in the state. So I'm gonna to talk uh, today a little bit, a bit about current epidemiology and then do a little bit on projections. Could I have the first slide, please? So uh, just to start off, since we're talking about variants today, I thought it'd be worthwhile to speak about variants. So uh, variants are basically sort of small differences that exist within a, 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 a single species of virus. So SARS-CoV-2 uh, has a long spike protein here in red that protrudes from its shells and is the thing that it, it's the part that attaches uh, to cells, um, to human cells in our case, and allows it to inject its uh, RNA. So but small variations in the amino acid sequences in these proteins, remember that proteins are made up of a series of amino acids. In this case, it's about, and if I'm remembering correctly, it's 1,374. Um, if you have a single change in that, 
it can change the configuration, the three-dimensional configuration of the protein and uh, change its properties. And some of the things that the Delta has done is it can make it more easily transmissible uh, and it can make it more, easy, more difficult for antibodies to bind to. So the Delta variant specifically uh, has, um, uh, has three evolutionary advantages. It has mutations in the receptor binding domain, which is the tip of the spike protein, the piece that binds to the, uh, to the receptor that makes it essentially stickier. It's, it's a better covalent bond. Uh, it has a mutation in a cleavage site, the furin cleavage site, that makes it more uh, uh, efficient uh, for entering target cells. And it also has a, a mutation in, a, uh, in another part of the, of the spike protein closer down to the base that makes it a little bit less recognizable by, uh, by antibodies. So it has these three things going for it. The next one, please. Um, and what has that done? So in the, in the United States, we're now in the fourth wave or maybe the fifth wave, it depends on what you th want to think about April when we have an alpha uh, variant outbreak, the fourth or fifth wave of the uh, epidemic. And uh, luckily, if this were calculus, we could talk about the rate of change uh, declining. It looks like it's starting to slow down, although uh, we're still having increases that uh, cases have increased by 12% over the last 14 days hospitalizations by 22% and deaths, unfortunately, by 91%. The next one, please. And so if you say, where is this happening? Um, these are maps that these are conveniently located in the New York Times every, uh, every uh, day. Uh, if you look at uh, where the case counts per new cases per 100,000 people by county in the United States have been, in the darker here is the more, uh, more cases. And you can see they're heavily concentrated in the Southeast. And then also uh, in the inner mountain, sort of the upper inner mountain uh, region of the West uh, with you know, breakthroughs say, and like you can see sort of Southeastern uh, New Mexico uh, and a few in Hawaii and uh, at least on the big island of uh, a few in Alaska, and at least on the big island of Hawaii. So it's pretty diverse, but if you're gonna ask where they're real specific foci, I'd say it's in the Southeast uh, and in the Intermountain West. The next one, the other way to look at this is where there's risk. And I'm sorry that somehow Nebraska doesn't submit uh, data um, uh, to these systems. Um, you can say, where's the risk for people, risk the worst for people who are unvaccinated, um, and, which is really what we're talking about now. We can talk about breakthroughs all we want, but still the large majority of cases are among people who are unvaccinated. So it's across all of the Southeast and into the uh, sort of the lower Midwest, and then again into the mount, inner mountain West and out into the, frankly, out into the West uh, with uh, areas of California in the uh, Central Valley. Um, and then also in, in the Southern uh, California and Imperial and Riverside counties. Uh, but you can see where all these, uh, where the risk is uh, here. And this corresponds to areas where there's A, active transmission and B, fairly low levels of vaccination. The next one, please. So this is an interesting take. So this is driven by the Delta virus, the Delta variant. If you look on the left uh, in, this, in this histogram, this is a, one of these things that sums to 100%. Uh, you can see how Delta, which is a, the orange one, uh, really came on strong and displaced uh, the, uh, it really displaced the Alpha variant or the UK variant which is, in, uh, which is in this sort of aqua blue. Um, and it's now become the far and away the leading uh, variant in the United States, um, uh, you know, and is, um, accounts for at least 98% of all uh, current isolates. And I put in the part about the United Kingdom over here on the right, so you can see uh, what's happened. Now, of course, we flipped the cover, the colors, just to make it really confusing. But in these uh, panels, the orange is, is the uh, alpha variant and the blue is the delta variant. And you can see in the United Kingdom in the top two panels, how the delta came in and, dis and displaced the alpha variant. But what I wanted you to see was on the right, which is that it was associated with a large outbreak. Um, the same is true in the United States. This is as of July 14th, so it's uh, six weeks ago. And since then we've had our, our, our huge outbreak as Delta has displaced um, Alpha. The next one, please. Uh, 
Um, so how can we summarize this about what's going on in the US? We've had the rise of the more transmissible Delta variant. Now it's, all, it's almost 100% of all isolates in the US. And as uh, uh, people have said for generations, um, this is for, for vaccine preventable diseases, this is a cause of failure to vaccinate rather than vaccine failure. And while there is some vaccine failure, failure to vaccinate is far and away more important. And by failure to vaccinate, I'm also including people who've had a one dose of a two dose series. They are not particularly well protected. We're continuing to have mixing of unvaccinated people uh, with resultant transmission. Uh, we have less than full adherence to non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, such as masking. Um, and then as we move off of those as sort of the big four, we have some, uh, some proportion of the population, CDC estimates between two and 4% uh, of people, of adults in whom failure to develop immunity uh, was because of immunocompromise, solid organ transplantation, therapeutic use of drugs like tocilizumab. Um, but those are uh, reasons that they're, they are less likely to mount a robust immune response. Those people are the ones who need the, an extra dose, a third dose. And we should think of this for the people like that uh, who have those underlying issues uh, as a three dose series rather than a two dose series. And then depending on how, um, uh, how reliable the data are, uh, there's some evidence of declining vaccine effectiveness, which has been temporarily associated with the rise of Delta virus. In some, some quarters, this is refers to as waning immunity. Uh, there's also, um, at least theoretically, the possibility of vaccine escape mutations. And uh, this is what's led to uh, breakthrough infections, or this has contributed to uh, breakthrough infections. The next one, please. And when we talk about breakthrough infections, I think it's incredibly important to understand that if you have a population that's 100% vaccinated, all cases will be breakthrough cases in essence. So this is what we see in measles, um, is that when there's a large outbreak of measles, the people who get it are typically people who have been, well, there are some people who have not been vaccinated, but we see a large proportion of cases among people who've been vaccinated. That's because there's a finite failure rate of measles vaccine of maybe 5% or so. And similarly here, as we, uh, as we have more and more virus circulation, lighting, especially a very transmissible virus like Delta, we're gonna see a greater proportion of cases that are uh, vaccine failures or what we're calling breakthrough, uh, breakthrough cases. Now, it's not a perfect analogy because it, it, there's at least some degree of protection against severe disease and hospitalization, but there are, uh, there are a group of people uh, who for whatever reason uh, did not res uh, respond as predicted to, to vaccination. And as we get more circulating, there are gonna be a greater proportion of those people who are infected. The next one, please. Uh, so just to illustrate this with data from Los Angeles County from CDC uh, last week, um, if you look at hospitalizations in the solid blue line in the left-hand uh, panel, uh, the proportion of people, I'm sorry, these are cases, um, there was 4.9 times more likely to have a reported case in people who are unvaccinated than people who are vaccinated. And it was 29.4 times more likely to be hospitalized among people who are unvaccinated compared to people who are fully vaccinated. The next one, please. Now, uh, I was also asked to take out my crystal ball and predict the future. There's a fascinating article in the New York Times today if people are interested talking about two month periodicity of, of this disease. Um, it's kind of interesting theory. Um, these are data from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington, which I rely on for, uh, for predictions. Um, and this is what they're doing for their nearcast predictions to the end of the year. Um, and the, th the projections are here in the middle. The uh, current projection uh, is the middle uh, one, which would suggest that we're having a gradual decline um, in this current spike uh, and that will be you know, not back to normal, but uh, we'll have established a new baseline somewhere around the end of the year. The worst case scenario is in the red, the higher uh, line, which has to do with behavioral things like everybody who's been vaccinated, not wearing masks with increased mobility, um, irrespective of vaccine coverage and 
variants are spreading at a more rapid uh, pace than they, they currently are. And then the lower bound is, a, is if everybody adopts a 95%, 95% of people adopt wearing masks in, uh, in public spaces. So these are what the, uh, what the projections look like. You can see that all of them are kind of coming down by the, uh, by the end of the year. And um, none of them, none of these three scenarios predicts a surge, which is something we've been concerned about is that schools may lead surges, but there are a lot of kids who have been vaccinated and that may blunt some of the high school, middle school surge. The next one, please. This is a very similar thing, which looks at uh, bed usage in hospitals with a top line. These are national data, by the way, uh, with the top line being all bed usage and the uh, green line at the bottom being ICU usage uh, with some dropping off, um, peaking kind of roughly now in the next couple of weeks nationally and then dropping down. And then uh, the next one, please. Um, and so finally, what are we gonna do about variants? So there's actually a new, I've already done one interview today about a C.1.2 variant uh, from South Africa, uh, which WHO has said is not a variant of interest yet, but we have these variants of interest uh, out here from uh, WHO that they're following. One of the more worrisome one is the Lambda variant, which is in Eastern Peru, Western Brazil, kind of are in the Iquitos region, which does not seem to have grown particularly uh, over time, and I think is probably being outcompeted by the Delta. Uh, but uh, as a, I'll, I told Dr. Del Rio this yesterday, as a classics major, I can tell you there are 24 letters in the Greek alphabet, and we're uh, with Lambda, we're at 11, or Mu, we're at, at 12. So we only have 12 more to go in the WHO nomenclature system. So I hope that holds out a little bit of hope for everyone. And with that, I'll stop. Uh, thank you very much. Happy to answer questions. And thanks again for inviting me. Thank you so much, Dr. Rutherford. And so I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Wong to help us make sense of the current environment for children. As you know, a lot of children have returned back to school. We're seeing uh, the spread of the Delta variant. What are the implications for those who are unvaccinated, particularly young kids? Thank you so much. Next slide. I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to share some of the latest information on children in COVID-19. And as has already been alluded to, this is a tough time for kids in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the chart you see on your screen is the number of pediatric cases added per week in the US. We saw that peak uh, back in the winter and those darker blue bars. And as we move through data through last week, you see those lighter blue bars to the right showing that we are right back up there. So over 4.79 million kids who have tested positive for COVID-19 in this pandemic. Uh, that's over 203,000 pediatric cases added in the last week, which matches that winter surge. Um, and children, because a lot of them aren't yet able to get vaccinated, though it's great to see we are seeing more adolescents vaccinated, are representing a greater proportion of cases in the US, 22.4% for last week. And this tracks with increased hospitalizations among kids, again, reaching a new peak, unfortunately seeing 330 kids on average per day, as well as tragically 500 kids in the US who have died from COVID-19. Next slide. So with this pretty grim and worrisome picture, it's got a lot of people thinking, I'm a parent, I'm a pediatrician, I'm a public health professional, thinking what can we do to protect our kids from COVID-19, particularly those who aren't yet old enough to be vaccinated. And the resounding and number one thing we can do is to not wait to get vaccinated because COVID-19 vaccines are the first and best defense against COVID-19. Along with those rising case rates and hospitalizations, fortunately, we are also seeing increased rates of COVID-19 vaccination, including among our children, our adolescents who are already eligible. Um, and the way we protect our kids is to get as many people around kids vaccinated as possible. While we're doing great with some of our older adults, and you can see in that little black box, black box up on the right, above 70, 80, 90% in some of our older adults, we are seeing vaccinations lagging among younger, younger adults. For example, our 18 to 24 year olds, only 58.4% with data from last week from the CDC who are vaccinated. And these are representative people who are around kids. These are parents, these are caregivers, these are staff who are working in our childcare centers and in our schools. We also know that parental vaccination status is a marker for adolescent vaccination. 
And so vaccine hesitancy among parents can in and of itself lead to more missed opportunities to vaccinate teens. I have had so many teenagers that I care for myself who actually they themselves wanna get vaccinated but their parents are really against it. Um, and, th and those are tough conversations to be had. And then of course, when we think about who's around kids, we wanna make sure all of those teens who are already eligible get vaccinated because kids hang around with other kids. Um, next slide, please, or next click. And this is not a comprehensive list of strategies, but just a few to raise here. Um, the first is we wanna make getting vaccinated easy. People who are really eager to get vaccinated, they got vaccinated a long time ago. And when we think about children and the people who are around children, um, we wanna think about places where we can give onsite vaccine events so that, um, so that it's easy for them. And so one place, of course, to think about is our schools. And we know that schools can be really effective, if we can go back one more slide, please, um, in encouraging vaccinations and being places where kids already are. Parents are often already bringing their kids to um, a place that, places that are trusted in our communities. We need to continue to educate and earn the trust of our communities, adapting key messages that are out there, using the toolkits to fit the needs of the community, and that are responsive to concerns and particularly misinformation at this point, and thinking about our trusted information, trusted messengers, and how they themselves can be hosting information sessions. And then let's not forget about the role of employers, um, particularly for kids and, and, uh, and adults, thinking about flexible and paid sick leave. Uh, studies have shown that a quarter of parents whose kids remain unvaccinated have said, if I had paid sick leave to go bring them and flexible leave to bring them to get vaccinated, I would get them vaccinated. We are also seeing the impact of vaccine mandates from employers to increase vaccination. Next slide. In addition to vaccinations, as Dr. Rutherford was just saying, we wanna layer on additional protections, but again, emphasizing the importance of vaccinations is our number one tool here. Um, in addition to vaccinations, Proper masking is the most effective mitigation strategy when COVID-19 is circulating, as it is now, and vaccination is unavailable or where there's insufficient uptake. When thinking about kids and masking, let's focus on comfort and fit. For our older kids, there's a lot of uh, videos on YouTube and, and infographics to help figure out how to get that best fit. Uh, we have a lot, there are a lot of masks now where you can insert a filter, for example. Um, for our younger kids, and particularly our children who find it difficult to wear a mask, let's focus on comfort and whatever it is they're willing to wear. We would rather have a child wearing a mask that's, say, a single layer for a longer period of time than a really great mask they take off after five minutes. Just a reminder that our kids under two still should not be wearing masks for several reasons, including choking and suffocation hazards. And then as a pediatrician, lots of questions. Is this, how is this going to affect my child's development? We'll still be studying that for much, for many years to come, but it is reassuring to see evidence that is showing that kids can still recognize social and emotional cues from unmasked parts of the face. In addition to the masking, we wanna think about physical distancing, over six feet, choosing outdoors. We wanna think about that hand washing and respiratory etiquette, teaching our kids to sneeze or cough into their elbows, not to their hands, and then making sure to get tested early if you or your child has symptoms. We have monoclonal antibodies that can help prevent severe disease under EUA or emergency use authorization for people with high-risk conditions 12 and over, for example, obesity. There are insufficient data in children, but a important multidisciplinary panel is revisiting their recommendation that was originally against routine administration in children because there was not much data, but that's being revisited for our highest risk children, particularly because of what we're seeing happening with Delta. Next click, please. And then importantly, don't forget to keep up with kids' usual care. We are offering well child visits. Routine vaccinations are really critical for health. That will be particularly true this year with flu. We've got RSV that's been circulating at very high rates early, getting those synergist um, doses in. Reminder that you can co-administer COVID-19 with childhood vaccines. And don't delay their care. If you think your child is sick, please call your doctor for advice and additional instructions. We don't wanna wait till people, till our kids are really sick and having to go to our very full emergency rooms and hospitals. Next slide. Uh, lots of interest in schools, of course. Uh, my kids just started school over the last couple of weeks. 
The top line here is that schools are a safe environment for children and staff if mitigation strategies are followed. Again, in addition to getting as many people in schools and around schools and around children vaccinated as possible, masks are a really critical tool to use in schools. We now have a lot of data from the last several surges that Dr. Rutherford mentioned that spread in schools is low when, they're, when you're in a masked environment. And I've included on the slides here links to some studies in North Carolina, Utah, Wisconsin, that really demonstrate that that masking in schools is effective to control the spread. We also have evidence that you see higher rates in unmasked settings, including where students are involved. For example, a wrestling tournament in Florida, some early data that came out of Israel, and a more recent study looking at elementary schools in Georgia um, that both looked at masked and unmasked staff, as well as increased ventilation as an important and effective strategy. Um, again, similar to what Dr. Rutherford said, hopefully we're gonna get much higher vaccination rates, much lower rates of community transmission, which will allow us to safely transition away from universal masking of students and staff in K-12 schools. Um, in addition to masking, again, we wanna think about physical distancing in schools. We know that it is so important for our students, particularly some of our most vulnerable students to be in school and learning in school. And so the inability to physically distance should not limit in-person instruction when you can use other strategies like masking, getting as many people vaccinated as possible. And then I'm in North Carolina and we have some data to suggest that districts permitting one, two or three students per bus seat actually didn't see any difference in secondary transmission, which is important because I think our district and, and many others in the, um, in the country are struggling with having enough staff and buses to be able to provide transportation to school. Next click. Um, in addition, thinking about our modified quarantine policies in schools so that as long as kids are appropriately masked, we can really um, reduce or remove quarantine requirements, and that has shown to be safe and, again, promotes that very important in-person education. And then surveillance and symptomatic testing, which is more widely available, particularly the surveillance testing um, in this academic year. Because of where we are seeing outbreaks both before and already in this school year, considering more frequent testing for unvaccinated adolescents, as well as staff, and particularly those that are engaged in higher risk extracurricular activities, like we're seeing a lot of outbreaks, for example, in our, um, in our sports teams in high schools, for example. Next slide. So again, we've been really talking about how vaccines are our way out of this. Let's talk about adolescents and the Pfizer vaccine that they're eligible for. Um, these are data from as of July 31 that looked specifically at coverage of COVID-19 vaccines in adolescents. Uh, what we saw at that time is that, you know, starting to see increased uptake, really wide variation by state. You can see on that map there, ranging from 20% in Mississippi up to 70% in Vermont. Uh, not surprisingly, we see increasing coverage with age within that adolescent age group. And the good thing is the vast majority of those teens who had gotten their first dose also got a second dose. Like so much of the COVID-19 pandemic, we also see inequities with white children having higher COVID-19 vaccine rates than black children in the seven states at the time who were reporting race ethnicity for adolescent vaccine data and pretty stark in some places. So four times higher you can see there in Washington, DC and about two, two and a half times higher in Connecticut. Next click. And when, we, when parents have been surveyed about what are their intentions to get their unvaccinated teens vaccinated, the good news, and this is a little bit older data, is that about half of parents said they would get their teens vaccinated. Again, some differences looking at, uh, for example, parents who were female, Hispanic, living in the Midwest or South, having lower intentions. And the factors they said would increase their vaccine intentions were receiving more information about the vaccine safety and efficacy. Hopefully some of that here. Um, as well as COVID vaccine requirements in schools. Next slide. And when it comes to efficacy, I am not gonna go through all of these numbers, but just to say the vaccines work really, really, really well uh, to protect children as well as the broader population from COVID-19. We know that they work really well to prevent those COVID-19 associated, ho associated hospitalizations. We also know that they induce a really strong immune response in our 12 to 15 year olds. And I put some of the data and references there. 
And then importantly, in addition to these data we see in the clinical trials, we now have multiple studies showing that the vaccines are working really well in the real world in many parts of the US and in many parts of the world where that evidence is really um, adding up to say that we should feel very confident in how well the vaccines are working. Next slide. And then of course, we wanna make sure that the vaccines are safe too. And the top line here is that the benefits of the COVID vaccine far outweigh the risks for adolescents. This is again, some recent data that's come out summarizing looking at safety of the COVID-19 vaccines in teens in two really important system, the VAR system, which is a passive system where people can make reports in, and then in a smartphone-based system called Be Safe. And the top line here is that in those VAERS reports, the vast majority were non-serious adverse events, some of them bolded there. And then of the serious events, almost all of them were really consistent with a myocarditis diagnosis, which I'll talk about in a second. And then in VSAFE, again, what we're seeing in this profile of these side effects in teens is really matching to what we saw in the clinical trials. Next click. For myocarditis, um, we know that it is, it is associated with vaccination. It's great to see our safety systems being able to pick these up. Um, we know that it is very rare after vaccination, about 12.6 cases out of every million second dose administrations. We see it more often in our younger males. Um, we also know that myocarditis is more common after infection with some of the statistics there. Next slide. And finally, uh, one of the most common questions we get, of course, is, well, what about for our younger children? I happen to have children who are um, under the age where they're eligible to get vaccinated yet. So for Pfizer, and if you could click one more time, please. For Pfizer, um, received full approval on August 23rd for our 16 and 17 year olds. Their EUA was approved for 12 to 15 year olds on May 10th, and they're, they're gonna need some additional time to accrue before getting that final approval in that age group. For the five to 11 year olds, those trials started in March and ex we expect an EUA submission likely this month. And then they have also ongoing trials in the even younger children down to age six months. These are looking at different doses, at safety, tolerability, and immunogenicity across those different age groups. Expected enrollment around 4,500 children. For Moderna, I've hyperlinked to the Teen Cove study, which is the data used in the EUA requested on June 10th for 12 through 17 year olds. The Moderna um, is also currently being studied in Kids Cove, which is the trial in our younger children. Those also started in March with expected EUA submission um, in the five to 11 year olds this fall. Larger expected enrollment there. And then just two last things to say, which is that we do anticipate a smaller dose in our kids who are under 12, not just because they are much smaller than full grown adults, but also because of the immune response that uh, children are able to mount. And we'll also say that the AAP has urged the, uh, the FDA to think about authorizing these vaccines for children under 12 as soon as possible because of some of those trends I mentioned. And then final click. Uh, we also want to just mention, I also want to mention that the FDA and the AAP both strongly discourage off-label use of the Pfizer vaccine in kids who are under 12. Uh, providers who think about doing that risk um, violating their provider agreement will not have, li will be at liability for any potential adverse events as well as potentially forfeit payment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong, for a very clear presentation on the implications for our children. Of course, there are a number of questions that are coming up, and we'll come to that in just a moment. I would like to turn it over to Dr. Hotes to paint the picture for the rest of the population, quite a bit of interest around boosters, breakthrough cases. And so can you share with the audience how the rest of the population should, should expect the Delta variant to manifest? Yes, happy to, and um, and thank you to my two uh, colleagues for those comprehensive presentations. So I'll use my time to kind of fill some of the gaps and and uh, give some uh, discussions about where I think we're headed as a country, and also I want to talk briefly about where I think we're we're headed globally. So you know, as back in March and April, I think many of us were pretty optimistic. We were doing a good job vaccinating the country. Um, we were getting up to, um, uh, you know, a million uh, immunizations on a, on a daily basis. And there was this brief period where we were 
holding our breath and thinking we could vaccinate our way out of this epidemic in the United States because of the reproductive number of the virus said that if we get to 60 to 70 percent, you know, maybe we could really start to slow transmission. And then, uh, and that continued to happen in the Northeast, and especially in the New England states, some of the mid-Atlantic states. And that continues to be why they're doing so well. If you look at the vaccination, the various vaccination trackers, including the New York Times, it's, it's looking like almost all of the uh, adults and adolescents are getting towards full vaccination in states like Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. But what happened down here where I am in the South, I'm based in Houston, Texas, is that it ground to a pretty screeching halt as we met into June and July. And now we've got quite a frightening situation here in the Southern uh, United States. So if you look at vaccination rates by age, what you see is those over the age of 65, uh, there's not too much difference between the Southern states and the Northern states. So in the Northern states, you're getting over 95% of those over the age of 65 vaccinated. In the southern states, over 80%. Um, it's, it's a difference, but it's not a huge difference. Where, where the bottom really falls out is vaccination rates uh, under younger people, so young adults and, and uh, the teenagers, and, and there we're doing terribly. So unfortunately, in the south, you've got vaccination rates, for instance, among teenagers, 12 to 17-year-olds in the 25% range where it's three times higher in some of the New England states. And so this left a huge vulnerability and you combine that with the Delta variant, which is so highly transmissible because of that mutation in the 681 position, which created a more susceptibility to furing cleavage. What happened is this Delta is just it re accelerating through our unvaccinated young people in the South. and. Now what we're seeing are ICU after ICU get overwhelmed uh, with, with a younger age cohort. People in their 30s and 40s are the median age, for instance, in our Texas Medical Center, and a fair number of pediatric hospitalizations uh, as well. And for the first time, even pediatric intensive care units uh, get overwhelmed. So that's a very scary scenario. And of course, now we're up to 1,300 uh, uh, deaths per day. And um, we're getting uh, 100,000 hospitalizations. And, you know, Dr. Rutherford appropriately pointed out that in the last few days, maybe there's a glimmer of hope because there is some leveling off in that acceleration. Uh, I, I'm, but I'm still pessimistic because we are seeing a second node develop um, uh, after the Sturgis rally in Western South Dakota and, and then into Wyoming. And if you remember last fall, um, that's when we um, uh, saw the, that same type of acceleration. So I'm, I'm a bit worried. I'm worried that we're going to resemble what's happening in the United Kingdom uh, with their Delta variant, which is about a month or so ahead of us. And what's happened in the UK is it, it uh, was around 5,000 new cases a day. It went up to 40,000 new cases a day, and then it cut in half to around 20,000 new cases a day. And then everybody was very excited. They thought we're, you know, in the UK, they're finally going to get out of this. And then it went right back up again. And now it's around 30,000 new cases a day. So um, I'm a little worried that this slight slowing that we're seeing in the last few days is, is a temporary pause. And now we're going to see this accelerate uh, across uh, the country. And so, uh, you know, it's always dangerous to predict as we've learned with COVID-19. But I think what we might see happen, was, which is with the exception of um, the Northeast, some of the Northern states like Minnesota, Michigan, um, and some of the West Coast states, I think we're gonna see Delta continue to surge uh, over uh, the next few weeks at, at some level. And unfortunately, those Institute for Health Metrics evaluation projections you know, I think we're gonna be looking more at, at the worst case scenario rather than the, a good case scenario, which is up to uh, going up to 2,400 uh, deaths per day. And, um, and the final toll by the end of the year is could be between 700,000 and 800,000 uh, Americans, the total number for the full epidemic who've, who've lost their lives. And, 
And I think that's going to be very uh, destabilizing uh, for the country, both because of health systems overwhelmed and, and uh, staff, hospital staff, nursing staff, doctors already exhausted and, and somewhat demoralized. I think that's a vulnerability and we're gonna have to figure out a way to accelerate some workforce training. And, um, and, and we're still going to have people holding out uh, against getting uh, vaccinated. So I think we are seeing some autocorrection. In other words, some people are, you know, now people who've been vaccine resistant are seeing enough of their friends and relatives and colleagues get very sick into the hospital that there's a bit of an autocorrection and they are starting to get vaccinated. But I think this is not going to be uh, adequate. And so I think what you're going to see is a group that's deeply dug in um, even, even to the point where they'll refuse to get vaccinated despite employer mandates and federal mandates. And remember with mandates, the, uh, so much of it is said at the state level and that's going to be problematic. So I do see the next few weeks in this country going into the fall is a fairly unstable uh, time in the country. And, uh, and, and it's, so this, it's gonna still get uh, rough before it gets uh, better. And, and we've learned so much about this uh, anti-vaccine uh, and vaccine resistant groups. Um, we've seen this very strong uh, partisan divide in the country. And this has been an evolving story that not many people know about since uh, 2015, uh, when the anti-vaccine movement, um, a number of us, including a number of us on this panel, worked very hard to to debunk the fake links between vaccinations and autism. And we were successful, but then to re-energize the anti-vaccine movement uh, took on a political dimension around 2015 under the banner of health freedom, medical freedom. And this then became a sign of allegiance to the far right um, saying that you're not going to get vaccinated. And, and unfortunately that's with us today. And we still see this very sharp partisan divide. If you look at some of the data from Charles Gabba and others, it's, it's, it's very much along um, uh, those lines. And I think they're going to be very tough to reach because the disinformation empire is so robust. If you look at uh, the conservative uh, news outlets, the, 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 the conservative news anchors at night, um, the, some of the statements coming out of far right members of the United States Congress, House of Representatives and Senators and, and some of the executive leaders of the states, the governors, it's, it's, there's really, there's not much uh, effort to try to really encourage people to get vaccinated. And so I think this is going to be a continued problem for, for the country. Um, and then the question becomes, um, what can we do about this? Uh, and, and clearly, now with this Delta variant, which is so highly transmissible with a reproductive number, some say as high as eight, uh, that makes the percentage of the country that requires full vaccination uh, even higher than that 60 to 70%. Um, I've said 85%, I think Dr. Fauci said 90%, you know, getting upwards of measles levels required for vaccination. And that's going to be a very high bar uh, for the country, um, particularly um, not so much in the Northeast, but on a regional basis in the South. It's hard to imagine how we're going uh, to get there. And compounding the problem is we are seeing some waning evidence of waning immunity um, for the two mRNA vaccines, perhaps more so with the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine with two doses. Now studies from Israel. Uh, and, um, and some studies from the Mayo Clinic and elsewhere in the US are showing that protection against infection is going down from over 90% to for the 40 to 50% range. Now, um, before people can start to panic about that, it's important to remember that the vast majority of those breakthrough infections are either asymptomatic or low grade mild uh, infections, but that's, the, that's still a concern. And, and what we heard from the White House two weeks ago was their worry that the decline in vaccine effectiveness from over 90 to 40 to 50% for infection was, was the tip of the spear. 
and that we would start to see significant breakthrough hospitalizations. And that was the reason why they made the recommendation to move forward in, in charging the FDA and CDC to look into third immunizations. And this set off a pretty vigorous discussion uh, in the scientific community with uh, some saying, look, if you're not seeing significant amounts of breakthrough hospitalizations, let's, what's the point of uh, vaccinating? Um, wh whereas others uh, are, are not necessarily in agreement. And I, I tend to come out in favor, in favor of a third immunization because even if the hospitalizations are not going up a lot, I do very much worry about um, the, the emerging body of evidence around long COVID and its consequences. And unfortunately, now we have two smaller studies showing that with breakthrough, breakthrough cases among vaccinated individuals, we're seeing about 20% with uh, long lasting symptoms. And the more we learn about long COVID in adults, the, the more concerned I get um, and uh, most recently was uh, an unpublished study. It's in a preprint form in MedArchive out of the Oxford University Neurology Group showing significant levels of gray matter, brain degeneration in individuals with long COVID. And it's written by the Alzheimer's Research Group and they make um, the very concerning uh, statements that to them, this gray matter brain degeneration very much looks like what they see with the cognitive decline they see with aging or with Alzheimer's disease. And so I think, you know, we, we tend to um, frame the, the seriousness of this uh, uh, epidemic uh, almost overwhelmingly in terms of deaths and hospitalizations. And of course that's important, but I think the burden of disease from uh, long COVID has really been underestimated uh, in, in adults, even young adults, and I think this is something we're gonna to have to come to terms with. And this may be the basis uh, also for recommending that third immunization. And then this gets to the whole equity question and then, and then I'll stop because there's a lot of concern of the fact that the African continent is for all practical purposes unvaccinated and we're not doing that much better in Latin America and um, we're not doing that much better in Southeast Asia. And I think um, I have, a, and so therefore there's been a lot of emphasis on holding off third immunizations in favor of donating those doses globally. And, and in a piece in the LA Times this weekend, last weekend, I kind of framed it a little differently and it, and it goes something along the, the following lines. If you look at the numbers where you have 1.1 billion people in Sub-Saharan Africa, 650 million people in Latin America, another half a billion in the smaller low-income countries of Southeast Asia, that's two and a half billion people. We're gonna need five to six billion doses of vaccines. And the problem is for the new technology vaccines, the mRNA and adenovirus vectored vaccines, unfortunately, there was never a plan to make five to six billion doses of those vaccines, certainly, not through Operation Warp Speed in the US government. There was really no plan for how we're gonna have that much vaccine made, made available. And when you go so heavy on the innovation, meaning mRNA and adenovirus vectored vaccines, you almost guarantee that there's gonna be a problem because with any new technology, there's a learning curve of how you scale it and how you can uh, uh, produce it at the billions of dose range. And I think, there was a science policy failure and not really considering uh, the urgency of having sufficient amount of vaccine that you know you can scale. And, and that's what we're trying to do at our, our Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development. We've been developing global health vaccines uh, for uh, two decades, and we've been having a coronavirus vaccine program for over 10 years for SARS and MERS. We flipped it around for COVID-19, and we've now developed a recombinant protein vaccine um, that is looking really exciting in terms of levels of um, virus neutralizing antibody that are getting up there with M the mRNA vaccines. And, and what's nice about that technology is there's no limit to the amount you can scale. It's the same technology used to make the recombinant hepatitis B vaccine through yeast, yeast fermentation 
technology used globally and that we've been doing this even for kids for three or four decades. And so now this is um, uh, the, uh, in the big Indian producer Biological E is now scaling up to produce 100 million doses a month of that, that vaccine with the hope that in a few weeks it'll be released for emergency use. And now we've, um, uh, uh, are working now with Indonesia with Biopharma to make the halal version of, of the vaccine for the world's uh, Muslim uh, majority countries and another group uh, known as Immunity Bio, which wants to do this for South Africa. So what's, what maybe we can have a little bit of discussion about this. I know global health was not our major focus, but what's really interesting is our group, our Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development, which is co-headed by myself and Mary Elena Batazzi, we've worked together for 20 years, has been now doing Zoom calls several times a week with countries all over the world desperate for vaccine. And we're doing what we can to affect the technology transfer of our recombinant uh, protein vaccine. And the worrisome part is we're not getting a lot of help. Certainly there has not been uh, much engagement with the US government. And, uh, and so we're doing what we can uh, on our own. And, but I think what we've got to really push hard on is recognize that there just aren't enough mRNA and adenovirus doses to share and probably won't be for the foreseeable future. And that was the policy failure, the science policy planning failure from the get-go. But in the meantime, we think that we can move forward on our vaccine and potentially get a good chunk of the world vaccinated in the coming months if we can continue to get that help. And right now we're working uh, with these uh, vaccine uh, developers. So, um, so a sobering picture of where I see we're headed in the United States, um, where I think we, we will benefit from a third immunization, why the US government should make the commitment that for every dose we vaccinate, we at least share a dose with the world but recognize that's still not nearly enough. We've got five to 6 billion doses to make and hopefully ours will make a contribution. So uh, I'll stop there and hope we'll have lots of time for questions. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hotes. And you certainly did paint a sobering picture in particular that worst case scenario in that we may not necessarily be at the top of that curve. For the Delta transmission, of course, we have a number of questions coming in about the boosters. But I would want to turn to Dr. Katz as we're rounding out this conversation and then leave some time for Q&A. Um, Dr. Katz, you know, we talk about the end to the pandemics is through the vaccines and Dr. Hotez and others have talked about the efficacy of these vaccines, but it'll be helpful for you just to help us understand, are we using the right metrics? Is it about the end of the pandemic or going into a different phase? How should the public really anticipate the next several months? Well, thanks, thanks so much. And I have to say, I've, I learned so much just from listening to Drs. Rutherford, Wong, and Hotez. And I think it's a great session. I'm sure uh, the people who are listening feel the same way about their great presentations. Uh, I also think there's a certain appropriateness with having a New York speaker uh, because New York was so hard hit um, in March. Uh, we really were the epicenter of the epicenter. I know in my own health and hospital systems. I had to triple the number of ICU beds in order to accommodate the number of people I had on respirators um, as one example of just how bad it was. And New York City, which is the largest city in the whole US, essentially turned into a ghost town with no cars, no people on the street, no activity except in the makeshift ICUs in all of our hospitals. Uh, also an opportunity to say how much uh, we have progressed in terms of the science at that time. Uh, we didn't even have the ability to test people readily for COVID uh, in March. We were still sending our tests uh, to the CDC on a very limited basis we were still focused only on symptomatic people. Um, we uh, did not yet have the advances uh, that in medical therapy like steroid use or monoclonal antibodies, and we certainly didn't have uh, vaccines. I recognize the various two point that uh, Dr. Hotez meant about how uh, 
generalizable the technology is to the rest of the world, uh, but it's still quite notable that uh, we have three effective vaccines. Uh, and I certainly hope that leads to us being able to have a normal world uh, in the near future. Um, New York City has high vaccination rates. We're not like uh, the areas of the country that are under 50%, but we are still quite hard hit even in this phase uh, by the Delta virus. And I think what that shows is how effective the Delta uh, variant is in finding the unvaccinated. Uh, this is still overwhelmingly an epidemic of the unvaccinated. Um, and many of us would have hoped that uh, having rates of vaccination of 70% um, would in fact yield a, a kind of herd immunity. Uh, clearly that has not happened in New York. Uh, and clearly those people uh, who are saying that it must be much higher are correct. I, I want the audience to think for a minute about uh, as a country, um, the hard choices that that's going to require and use uh, my own uh, hospital staff as an example, uh, health and hospitals, we have about 35,000 employees uh, and we are now up to about 75% of my employees are vaccinated. And on one hand, that's great. Uh, that is way more than many parts of the country. But think about the 25% who still um, feel that it's not in their interest to be vaccinated. And I want to be very respectful of those people. As a primary care doctor, the last thing I've ever wanted to do is to uh, compel someone to take a medical intervention that they don't feel comfortable with. But as a public health official, I have to ask myself, how will we ever get to the end of this pandemic if we're not able to fully vaccinate everyone? And 75% is not sufficient. And it's important to think about, um, uh, Dr. Wong was talking about the uh, importance of making the vaccines easy and available for school children. I love that we in New York City as we open our schools, we're gonna have vax clinics in all of our schools for the kids who are old enough to get vaccination. But when we're thinking of my staff, we're talking about a highly educated group of people who are mission driven, uh, who are interested in health issues and are committed to working on health issues um, and who have had access to the vaccine since they were available in January. Uh, all of my facilities have uh, vaccines available without appointments on site. Uh, all of my staff uh, can receive four hours of time off in order to go and get that vaccine. Um, so I view it as an ideal situation. Um, and um, the best case scenario, uh, and still I'm only at about 75%. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, the city and the state have uh, promulgated vax mandates. Uh, the state has promulgated one that will include all of my facilities starting September 27th. Everyone will have to be uh, vaccinated unless they have a, uh, a medical reason that prevents their vaccination. Um, the city is increasingly uh, limiting where people who are unvaccinated can go for, you know, fun optional activities uh, like concerts um, and movies and gyms. Uh, the schools are going to require all of our teachers um, to be uh, vaccinated. And we do these things not lightly, but because we don't see how else we return life to normal. How else we guarantee our children can go to school, our economies can flourish, people can have jobs. Uh, as public health people, we know that socioeconomic status is one of the most important determinants of health and that COVID has had a destructive 
impact on our economy, on people's ability to educate themselves, on uh, jobs, on the ability to maintain housing. And we have to move away from that. Um, as public health people, we also recognize that there has been a misinformation campaign uh, that has system uh, systematically given people the wrong message. Um, there are profound ethnic disparities that, that uh, are involved with people's prior experiences of healthcare and the way um, that the medical profession has not consistently treated the black and brown communities well. Um, and so people have you know, justifiable reasons to be skeptical, but we have to be more effective um, because to, to return to the, the question posed, what is the most important metric? I think that it's vaccination. Um, the breakthrough cases that we are seeing are overwhelmingly asymptomatic or uh, mildly symptomatic. Uh, so that in a world where everyone is vaccinated, um, then uh, we uh, will continue to have COVID. Uh, there's no reason to believe this virus is going away um, any more than the 1918 virus went away. Uh, but in order to learn to live with it, um, we're going to have to be vaccinated. Um, I see no other way uh, out of this pandemic. That vaccination rate is going to have to be very high, uh, which means that um, there's going to need to be uh, vaccine mandates. Historically, that's been what's required um, to eliminate vaccine preventable diseases is mandates. We haven't done uh, as good a job with vaccinations when those uh, vaccines are uh, voluntarily decided. So I think the metric that I'm looking for is vaccinations. Uh, I will follow very closely hospitalization rates um, uh, and uh, rates of death. Um, but I, what I want to see is full vaccination. I think to uh, complement what Dr. Hotez has had raised as well about both unvaccinated in our country and the large number of people who are unvaccinated in, in the world, uh, what is most likely to lead to other variants is uh, uncontrolled reproduction of the virus in humans. Um, and so uh, we are running the risk the longer we go with unvaccinated people, both domestically uh, and abroad, the greater the risk we have um, that there will be emergence of a variant that may not be sensitive to the vaccines that we currently have available. And so there is you know, tremendous urgency for full vaccination in our country and availability of vaccination uh, throughout the world. I'm really looking forward to hearing people's questions and, and the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Katz, um, particularly for those metrics in terms of how we should be thinking about the next several months. Thank you to all of our speakers for such great, clear presentations. And we have a number of questions that have come in, uh, far too many for us to answer all of them, but I will try to highlight some of the key questions. And if I can invite all of you to turn your cameras back on. We'll start with Dr. Hotez. We've had a number of questions around boosters. Um, in particular, what the data indicate around a booster being needed um, and the potential for mixing and matching. If you received an mRNA vaccine, does it matter whether you boost with that same mRNA vaccine or not? Um, and or if you had a j, j vaccine, should you boost with an mRNA? So if you can touch a bit about boosters, the data um, really is that at that uh, six month timeline, eight month timeline, and the mixing and matching. Right, so we clearly are seeing, oh, it says, it's giving me instructions here, sorry. Um, we, we are, you know, there is now evidence for uh, what appears to be waning immunity, and we are seeing this decline in effectiveness 
from over 95% and it's cut in half uh, against infection. Um, there, one of the problems with evaluating this is there's two things going on at the same time. There, we're seeing probably a decline in infection and there may be some diminished efficacy against the Delta variant, which kind of mud muddies the water a bit. And the way I look at it is, if you remember when that, those vaccines were released uh, in December, January, December last year, and then January, um, we were in a horrible crisis, right? We were, we needed to get the healthcare providers immunized. We needed to get the nursing home residents immunized and the vulnerable populations immunized as fast as we could. And that was the basis for recommending a three to four week interval um, between uh, those, those first two doses for the mRNA vaccines, three weeks for Pfizer BioNTech, four weeks for Moderna. And that was done to get the American people fully immunized as fast as possible. And, and I think it was a good decision. I, I agree with that decision and it saved a lot of lives. The only problem with it is if you were designing a vaccine um, purely from the standpoint of durability or length of protection, that's probably not the schedule you'd want to use. I mean, if you look at most of our, certainly our childhood vaccines, whether it's diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, or haemophilus influenza type B or injectable polio vaccines, we give pretty rapid fire immunizations as infants, and then we pause and then give a six to six month to 12 month boost after that. And we know that's what gives you that big increase in, in, in durable protection. And so, for instance, when we're designing the malaria vaccine, the Moscorix malaria vaccine for Africa, same kind of thing. You know, you give several primary immunizations and then you give a boost significantly later on. And so in some ways, in the way I, way I think of it is by going to that three to four week interval, we almost kind of guaranteed that it was going to be a three dose vaccine at some point. I think um, where I get some pushback when I say that is from colleagues, and, and, and they may be right, I may be wrong, that who say, well, again, we're not seeing significant breakthrough hospitalizations. Part of the problem is we're not looking either. We don't have, I mean, there's no website out there that lists the, um, all the major medical centers and breaks it down by hospitalizations by vaccinated and unvaccinated. So the numbers are a bit all over the map. Some some say they've got 20% that are um, even in low vaccination uh, states getting to Dr. Rutherford's nice slide about um, how the percentage of uh, vaccinated goes up in, 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 in high vaccination coverage states. But even among low vaccination coverage, we are getting hospitals of 20% vaccinated in the hospital. But these are all anecdotes. There's not really a well-coordinated presentation of data out there nationally that we really need to see. And in Israel now, what's interesting is they, they are seeing that, and they're also seeing the benefit of giving a third immunization where it seems to restore that protection against infection again. Again, it's a small study. And so the problem is we've got, um, you know, the, the, the data is uh, not, most, the vast majority of data is unpublished and a lot of it is not even on preprint servers like BioArchive or MedArchive. It's on, you know, the Ministry of Health of Israel website, or we're seeing it from shareholders uh, presentation, PowerPoint presentations from Pfizer and Moderna, or we're, um, you know, getting in bits and pieces like that, or we're getting it through press releases. And this is, of course, this is not a way to do science. So um, I think what's going to be really important is that we give the FDA and the ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, adequate time to really do a deep dive in the, into the data and to, to, to give us, so you can really see everything that we have in hand, because all of us right now are just getting these bits and pieces. So uh, I, I think we will go to a third immunization. Uh, uh, I think there's, you know, part of it is for breakthrough hospitalizations, but again, uh, I'm, a ver I'm very concerned about the long haul COVID question um, uh, and, and high rates of breakthrough cases leading to long haul COVID up to 20% in that recent New England uh, Journal 
uh, paper. I think for the J and J vaccine, um, we may have even less data. There, um, you know, when that data, when when the phase one, phase two data came out with the J and J vaccine, I always thought it would be a two dose vaccine because the levels of virus neutralizing antibody were really high and it brought everybody up to the same level, but they they went for an indication for a single immunization. We'll have that phase, we'll have phase three data on two doses pretty soon. So I think it's a good possibility we'll move to a two dose vaccine. With regards to mix and match, we again, there's not a lot of information out there. There's a study from the UK that looks at Pfizer and AstraZeneca mix and match, and it seems to do well. Um, you know, if you want to extrapolate and say J and J is also an adenovirus vaccine like the AstraZeneca, it's a reasonable thing to do. You know, it's one of the most common questions I'm asked, and and unfortunately, you know, it's it is frustrating that we just don't have uh, a lot of J and J data. The other question I'm asked a lot is people are making a big deal of the Moderna released some information that the antibody levels were two times higher than Pfizer. I actually don't make that much of it, you know, to, there's, there's not that linear correlation between levels of virus neutralizing antibody and protection or other factors, of course, that go into this. And the Moderna vaccine was given an extra week apart. That may be a difference. The amount of RNA antigen in the Moderna vaccine is much higher than the Pfizer. And then, you know, when Tony Fauci presented some data a week or so ago, he showed a 30 to 40 fold rise in virus neutralizing antibodies from the third dose. So I think, uh, again, this is what happens when we do science by press release. It sends people running off in different directions that are, are, are probably not helpful. Um, but I, you know, if, if that data holds up with the third immunization, I think that that should put that to rest. I got the, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. I'm very happy with it. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and so don't feel that all of a sudden that there's some inferior aspects of that. And I think that's another part of the problem with the whole US vaccine program is the mRNA vaccines were sort of held out there as some sort of magic and, and they're not, they're good vaccines, no question about it, but there are also other ways to achieve it through recombinant protein vaccines and others. Uh, thank you so much. And of course, um, I don't think as a public, we've ever been in a circumstance where we've known exactly the manufacturer of each vaccine that we've taken over our, our lifetime. So it is. Yeah, yeah we have we have to improve unique. our dinner. We have to improve our dinner time. It's a, it's a unique circumstance. Dr. Wong, I want to come to you because there are a lot of questions coming in about whether or not, um, you know, with the number of cases we're beginning to see in children, is the Delta variant more causing more severe disease for children versus the wild type we saw with the original virus out of Wuhan? Could you just comment on that? How concerned should the public be about more severe disease for children in particular who are not vaccinated given Delta? Uh, I think we should be concerned. We know that it is more transmissible and it is transmissible more among people who are unvaccinated, which include our children who are not yet eligible to be vaccinated or who have remained unvaccinated for our eligible teens. Um, as I think Dr. Hotez referenced and, and others, we are seeing um, our cases in hospitalizations as well as ICUs rise. So there is a concern that it is more severe, not that it is, and I welcome the other panelists to comment here. There are, I think, three pediatricians on this panel today, uh, not that this is, particularly worse in children compared to adults, but just, just in general, it is more transmissible. We are seeing evidence of faster, more severe disease with the Delta variant. But again, welcome other comments from the other panelists. And then just to be clear as well on the, on the question, you know, of course there's a misinformation that children do not get as sick as adults um, with either the wild type or Delta, or et cetera. And of course now we're seeing kids uh, more and more cases. Can you just address that misinformation for a bit in the sense that kids don't get sick as much from COVID-19? We are seeing the spectrum of illness in children as we are in adults, ranging from kids who remain asymptomatic and have COVID-19 to being severely ill. And as I mentioned, 500 deaths of U.S. children so far in the pandemic. So we are seeing that full spectrum. And then I'll just mention the long COVID that we're seeing in kids. And I have taken care of some patients myself with long COVID. It is, it is really troublesome 
to see as a, as a provider for parents, it is so distressing. Um, and so really thinking about doing all those things that we've talked about today to protect our kids as much as possible, getting vaccinated, doing those layered protection strategies. Great. Yeah. And, and I'll just, just chime in and say, I absolutely agree. I think, you know, there is this narrative coming out of groups with people, you know, who, who have an agenda that try to make the case that COVID-19 is exclusively a serious illness for those over the age of 65. And we know that's just not the case, especially with this Delta variant. So many young people are getting sick. I think one thing that would be really helpful is if we had better numbers on and standardization of long COVID in young people. There was a nice paper in JAMA showing 26% of long COVID in young adults, um, but and that was pretty high. But but in terms of younger age groups, adolescents and kids, again, the the numbers I'm seeing are are vary everywhere from 2% to 50%. And I think a lot of it has to do with there's not no standardization of metrics and how we are evaluating long COVID, especially the cognitive effects, neuropsychiatric effects. So standardizing that I think would be really helpful to better get our arms around it. And then of course, we just don't know uh, also about uh, the, the uh, structural changes to the brain and the young developing brain. And, so we really, there's a real urgency, I think, to get that information out, especially as we're keeping our kids in school this fall. Well, thank you both. I want to come to Dr. Rutherford. We have, we have some questions here, um, really around this premise that usually genetic evolution of viruses, they lead to new strains that take advantage um, of evolutionary um, potential for more transmission, but not necessarily leading to more severe disease. Can you talk about that as we think about the other variants of interest? We're seeing, of course, Delta being more transmissible than Alpha. What are your thoughts as we see the lineages? Should we expect more transmission, but less severe illness? I, you know, I mean, it's always, it's always difficult to think like a virus. And as I always love to start off my live TV interviews with the phrase teleologically speaking, comma, um, you know, just to stump them. Um, but it, it's, you know, I, you know, in an evolutionary sense, what, what does a virus want to do? It wants to make lots of little viruses and it doesn't want to kill its host. So, yeah, I mean, you know, this start, this is like Michael Crichton and the Andromeda strain, but that's the, you know, that that's how these things work. Uh, now, whether it works over the, um, you know, over this period of time we're talking about, or whether that's more of a 10 or 15 or 20 year uh, window, um, is another is another issue. So I, I'm, you know, I, I think that that would likely be the way to go. The other thing is that there are probably a finite number of mutations that can really, uh, you know, that really will increase transmissibility and not be fatal mutations for the virus. So maybe we've seen them all probably really haven't, but you know, we're kind of coming, we have a, a fairly robust series of variants with that we've studied with um, lots of different viral mutations. Um, and I think we might be able, you know, somebody at Los Alamos or somebody, you know, someplace could be predicting where the next uh, sort of next stable uh, variants and stable mutations might come from that would be associated with increased transmissibility. But it's, you know, it's guessing, it's, it's all guessing at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, I think just saying that I think is, is quite helpful and, and important to, to put out what we know and what we don't yet know. Dr. Katz, there's a question here. We talked about vaccine uh, misinformation and, and certainly the messages around masking have been quite challenging, I'm sure, for the public to, to track. Um, what are the strategies that we need to have in place to get those right messages to that population that continues to be hesitant, even as we're seeing increased hospitalization and death. You know, some have said, where is the Elvis Presley um, of today of COVID-19 uh, really drumming up um, a lot of, uh, of, you know, individuals and public to go and finally get their vaccine. Are there any strategies that you think uh, would work but we're not necessarily emphasizing? Uh, well, we're, we're public health people. So we know that what works is trusted messengers um, and that, the message is usually best given by someone who is very close to the person you're trying to give the message to. So we've had good luck with community groups. We've had good luck with clergy. 
Uh, we have had good luck with sports stars. Um, but uh, I, my, my own view from New York, again, where I feel like we've been in a best case scenario is that even after we've done that, um, there is so much misinformation out there and, and so much fear and you know, a general disbelief in science um, that I don't think our country has seen before where people simply don't believe you, you explain the data in the correct words, um, developmentally appropriate, culturally appropriate, uh, but people don't believe the science um, and that that creates a whole and uh, I think it will be interesting and people will have to watch uh, what effect the vax mandates have in the end do people you know quit their jobs or do they get vaccinated um, and sometimes you know even if ideally we don't like mandates and I think again public health you know, we always try to appeal to people to, to do things voluntarily, same in primary care, but sometimes people need a little extra push. Um, and I'll be interested to see, and we'll have a lot more data come September when a lot of these mandates go into effect. Thank you so much. Dr. Hotz has one final quick question to you um, in just the brief moments we have. So if you don't mind just keeping the answer brief and short, looking into the crystal ball, um, when are we going to get past this pandemic? What are the expectations for the fall into the spring? Should we, are we going to live with this for a long period of time? How should we be thinking about the next year to several years? Well, you know, one of the, this has been a very humbling pandemic and I've learned not to try to project too far. Um, I think, you know, with that third immunization, I think this will produce more durable, long-lasting protection. I don't know that for sure. I'm, I come out on the side, I don't think we're gonna need annual boosters after that, um, but we'll see. I know the Pfizer CEO has talked about co-formulating flu and COVID vaccines in anticipation of that possibility. I, I don't think we're gonna need to go there. I think once, if once we get that third immunization, I think it's gonna be pretty robust and durable, long lasting protection. I think how we do as a nation really depends on, on those last 30 to 40 million people who may hold out. And, and that's gonna be an ongoing problem uh, for, for the country. And so trying to figure out how we can bridge that partisan gap and really uh, appeal to uh, groups that are sort of deeply dug in. And, and one of the things that I worry about is, and I, I, and I do agree mandates are important, both federal mandates and even school mandates. But what that's also going to do is there's gonna be a cohort of people who will leave the workforce for that reason. And they will be angry and, and deeply resentful. And that's, that in itself is gonna create some instability. So that's an extra layer of concerns uh, that I have. I do feel confident that if we could get to really high rates of vaccination, we could halt this epidemic, but it's also gonna mean vaccinating the Southern hemisphere and the United States as a country has not stepped up and made that commitment. We've never had an address from the president or the secretary of state to just give us the, the simple back of the envelope calculation that I just gave. six. We've got 6 billion people that need to get vaccinated. Here's what the Excel spreadsheet looks like. This is what we, here's the inventory that we have. I don't think we're gonna get there with mRNA vaccines and adenovirus vaccines, even if all the G7 countries tomorrow shared all of the doses they had, it would get us a very tiny fraction of the way there. And so we got to figure out a way to step up and produce another few billion doses of vaccines. And we've, got to stop this nonsense of saying we'll do it by 2023 or 2024. We've got to do it now and and we can do it. And we just haven't made that commitment as a country and and neither of the G7 countries. So I think those are, those are the big, uh, for me, the big picture issues. Well, thank you so much. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you to all of the panels, uh, panelists and your presentations, which were quite clear, quite comprehensive, uh, really helped us understand where we are 
on so many fronts with our children, with everyone else and how we can get through this pandemic. Um, certainly the takeaway for me is vaccination, 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 uh, but certainly we cannot end this without the rest of the world getting access to those vaccines. Um, so thanks again to everyone who uh, participated and registered for today's webinar. You will receive an invitation to the next webinar. Um, as mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded. The recording, a transcript, and the slide presentations will be available on covid19conversations.org. Thanks again to our panelists in the National Academy of Medicine and the American Public Health Association for co-sponsoring this webinar series. If you have any ideas or suggestions for future webinar topics, uh, please email apha at apha.org. And thanks again to our listeners for joining us today and throughout the series. Best wishes to all of you for health and safety. Take care and we will speak to you next time.